After completing the Quran week program in Kuala Lumpur, Ustad Norman was invited to visit the Mufti of the Federal Territories Office in Putrajaya, where he spent time with the executive staff there and delivered a talk on contemporary Muslims and their challenges. Uh, I'd like to first start by saying it is an honor to be here, and I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that this brief conversation is of some benefit uh, for myself and for all of you. Uh, and we pray that Allah Azza wa accepts this as an act of ibadah and a means of our forgiveness. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is I am the farthest thing from a sheikh. Uh, not at all a sheikh. Uh, I am not a scholar. I am not, um, I don't claim to be one. And I know that I'm not one. I am a uh, very enthusiastic student and researcher uh, in the study of the Quran to the best of my ability. And alhamdulillah, I have the benefit of working with some very remarkable scholars that helped me in conducting that research also. I'm not going to share some deep knowledge with you. I'm going to share something based on experience with you, inshallah. As I've traveled the Muslim world and met with communities of Muslims in also non-Muslim countries, uh, more and more I see that there is similar trends. So instead of seeing the world as, oh, there's a very different situation here and a very different situation there, yes, there are differences, but the common trends are too common and we have to observe them. And if you don't understand a problem, you cannot work towards a solution. So I want to identify in this brief talk at least three categories of Muslims that we have to be aware of. Of course, we're all one ummah. Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida. But it's good to understand segments and, uh, within the ummah. And the way I would like to divide these segments today is by way of their relationship with Islam. So... Like if you, if you think of Muslims not by their ethnicity or by their school of thought, but you think of a Muslim in terms of their relationship with Islam, uh, I'm going to offer you three categories. So the first category, and I think the most important category, I like to call them uh, Muslims on the edge. Muslims on the edge. So uh, this is inspired by an ayah, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفِ Right, so there's among people there's somebody who worships Allah on the very edge. So these are Muslims that they may be born in a Muslim family, they may have been raised uh, in a Muslim family, but they are very much a part of the modern world. And many of their ideas have been influenced by university, media, business, the outside world to the point where their connection with Islam is reduced to my parents are Muslim or we have Eid. Or, you know, in Ramadan, I'm, I'm not supposed to eat in front of my mother or something. Like their, their relationship with Islam has been reduced to almost nothing. But they still identify themselves as Muslim. A lot of their practices, a lot of their life priorities, life habits, they don't seem to be corresponding to Islam. And this is similar to there are lots of Christians in the world who identify themselves as Christian, but only in the sense that they belong to the Christian civilization. So they would call them civilizational Christians. So there's a, there's a growing population of Muslims that are civilizational Muslims. And when, it, when you speak about Islam, uh, or their attitudes towards Islam, uh, the answers are very similar. And the, 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 the attitude is, Look, religion is a personal thing. You can have your Islam, I have my Islam. In your Islam, you pray five times, good for you. In my Islam, I have a, my connection to, to God is in my heart. He knows what I feel. So, you know, th this is not something that you should be forcing on me. I can figure it out for myself. And slowly but surely, this category of people, they're good people. I'm not, you know, as we hear that, it sounds disturbing to a practicing Muslim. These are good people. But they never really had a real reason to practice their religion because their religion was only given to them as a culture. And because the, the culture of the world changed, they could say, well, I don't, I don't talk like my mom or my dad or my grandfather used to. I don't use the sec same technology as them anymore. So I don't have to follow the same religious practices. That's for the older generation. Times have changed, right? So this is a very large population of Muslims. Uh, sometimes they have very serious doubts about Islam itself, but they don't say it. 
And they don't say it because if they say it, their their mother will have a heart attack. So they 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 keep it inside. They'll their mother will say, "Go Jumaa time, Jumaa time, Jumaa time." So they'll go to Jumaa, and they're sitting there. Why am I sitting here? It doesn't make any sense. I just want to get back to work. But I'm here because my mom for or my dad or my brother or whoever or everybody's going. Everybody from the office is going. I'll go too, but I don't really care. So there, these are the Muslims on the edge. And this is a very, very large population of Muslims. They're very large population of Muslims. Okay. The second category uh, is Muslims seeking answers. These are Muslims who used to be on the edge, like the first group, but something woke up inside them and they decided, no, I want to be consciously Muslim. I want to know about my religion. I feel like this is the truth and I want to understand it better. The problem with this group of Muslims is that they wish to learn about Islam, but they are, because they're coming from the edge, the, the language they speak, the language that they're used to, the culture that they're used to is almost like the non-Muslim cultures. So they have a very hard time adjusting in Islamic environments. So even when they want to learn about Islam, they feel a little bit awkward coming into a masjid and sitting in a halaqa. Because this is not, they've never sat in something like this before. This is not their scene. They're very comfortable in the lobby of a hotel. They're very comfortable even at a bar. But they're a little bit awkward inside the masjid or the Islamic convention. Or if they see too many beards and too many hijabs, they get a little intimidated. Like these guys are all way too more, much more Islamic than I'm just starting and they're already super level 10 and I'm basically at zero. So they, they feel like they don't know where to begin. They also feel like the rest of the Muslims who are practicing, they judge them a lot. So even though they want to learn, they feel judged and they feel they don't fit. So they are left with only one choice they're going to find their Islam online. So instead of finding Islam physically in a masjid, in a halaqa or somewhere else, they're going to go online and search and find videos. And then of course, whoever they, they end up liking, they'll watch more and more of their content. That's what's happening with the second group. So the first group was Muslims on the edge. And the second group is Muslims that are seeking. Muslims that are seeking. Now there's a third group. This third group, and there are more groups, but I'm only talking about three groups. There are many more groups, but I wanted to focus in this talk. So the third group I will say is Muslims with harsh views. This is what I will call them, Muslims with harsh views. So what happens is somebody was seeking, and they found online somebody who's teaching Islam, and they started, hey, this makes sense. And they started listening to them and listening to them and listening to them. And when they listened to them, they said, this is the right Islam. This person has the right aqidah. This person has the right understanding of sharia. They have the right understanding of sunnah. So they give their complete trust to this follow the, the person they're following, this influencer online, the shaykh online, whoever, or a group. And then they develop the view that this is the right way and everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is going to Jahannam. These are the only people that are saved. And... It's on, it's on every issue. It's not even like overall on every single issue. So it could be like, for example, they develop an idea about how long the beard should be. Tulul lihya, for example, right? Now, if somebody doesn't fit their definition of the length of the beard, they are hatab jahannam. They are made for, you know, this is a inkaru sunnah. This is tariku sunnah. This is... You know, and it maybe even, you know, wajib al something. Like, they're going to develop those harsh, harsh, harsh views. Their, their views could be about the rights of the wife. There could be about the beard. It could be about clothing. It could be about the definition of halal and haram. It could be anything. But they start developing very, very harsh views. And because they develop harsh views, these people are not fun to live with. <laughs> so they develop a lot of problems in their family and among their friends. They become more and more isolated, okay? Because their family sees them as too extreme. So now I've given you three groups of people. This is the, these three populations exist in the millions and millions and millions. This is not one person. Each one of these is hundreds of millions of people. So this, 
Understanding this and what to do about this is a very serious global problem, right? And sometimes when people talk about global problems and global solutions, we think about government level, policy level, funding level issues. But at the, at the end of the day, actually, the global s- structures are made up of individuals and individuals have these tendencies. So I'm going to suggest some things for each of these groups. I don't have the complete solution. I don't think anyone does. But we can think about some solutions for each of these groups to help with this problem. So the first group, if you remember, was Muslims on the Edge. There are two things I think we can do. Muslims on the Edge should be engaged in conversation about why they are Muslim to begin with. Why they're Muslim. Because right now the answer for them is, I am Muslim because my parents were Muslim. That's their answer right now. Okay? Or their answer is, I don't know. I just maybe because my luck was I was born in Malaysia, that's why I'm Muslim. If I was born in India, maybe I would have been Hindu. If I was born in England, maybe I would have been Christian. Like so they they're just saying I, I don't really know why. For for that category of people, we need to create material resources that even if they're not seeking it, because they're not trying to learn about Islam. So they're not gonna come to Islam, Islam has to go to them, right? This is not, this is uh, basically uh, tabligh, getting the message out to them, okay? Because if you invite them to a conference, or you invite them to a program, or you invite them to a halaqa, no thank you, not interested. That's not what I want. So we have to figure out a way of getting something to them onto their device, into their ear, onto, you know, in some way in the media. And the subject matter should be, I think it should be revolving around the foundations of Islam. Meaning, why should we believe Islam is the right religion? Why should we believe Quran is from Allah, from God? Why do we believe this is the correct way of life? Why is this in the deen and Allah al-Islam? Why? And it needs to be presented in language that doesn't sound Islamic. This is important. Because if you sound Islamic, they change the channel in their brain. They don't want to hear Islamic language because they're not, they, that's not, they're not interested. So the message has to be presented, but it has to be presented in language that they can understand and relate to. So it's not the language of the halaqa, and it's not the language of the khutbah. Because that language is for Muslims who are already ready to listen. These are people that are not ready to listen. An example of this from the Qur'an is Surah Al-Adiyat. When Allah revealed وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَا فَالْمُورِيَاتِ خَضْحَا فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ سُبْحَا Al-Adiyat, everybody knows here, you guys are more knowledgeable than I am, is about horses. This is about horses running fast. It has nothing to do with Akhirah. It has nothing to do with Tawheed. It has nothing to do with uh, Al-A'mal Al-Saliha. Nothing. There's no, there's no uh, Indar or Tabshir. There is no wa'id, there is no da'wa ilallah, there's no, there's not, there's no tawheed, nothing in the ayat of wal'adiyati dabha, falmuriyati qadha, falmughirati subha, fa'atharna bihi naqa, fawasatna bihi jama'a. Five ayat that have no, no message in them except horses running. That's it. But you know what? For the Arabs of that time, they loved horses. So when they hear wal'adiyati dabha, falmuriyati qadha, they're watching the trailer of an action movie. Whoa, what? Hadiyati Dabha. I like it. Muriyati Qatha would tell me. Then what happened? What? So they they were Allah spoke to them in what you can call non Islamic language. You see? And he got there and then he gave the, the drop the message in the insan ali rabbihi lakadud. Right? So this is actually a Quran based strategy for people that don't want to listen. And we have to develop that kind of media where they're watching and they don't even know. Wow, this is pretty amazing. This is pretty amazing. And then at the end you just you get the message. I'll I'll give you a shaitani example of this too. Okay? A shaitani example of this is a, a, a TV show a uh, very famous TV show. I don't think it's running anymore. It's called House. Okay, House is about a very intelligent, brilliant doctor who works at a hospital who 
No, no other doctors can solve the patient problem. The patient is about to die. Nobody can solve this problem. And this guy always figures out somehow what the diagnosis is. Every test has failed. Every analysis has failed. Not, they can't find the problem. He finds the solution. And you know what? When people are about to die in the hospital, if they're Christian, then they bring the priest. If they're Muslim, then the Imam comes. If they're, if they're Jewish, then the rabbi comes and everybody's praying because the person is dying. Or they're making dua, or they're reciting Quran, reading the Bible, rosemaries, whatever, right? And this guy, this doctor house, is a hardcore atheist. He's atheist. He makes fun of all these people that are praying for the patient. Okay, the whole show, several seasons, is about how stupid religion is. And how stupid people of any faith are. And how smart people, because he's the smartest one, how smart people can solve problems, and religious people are just looking for prayer because they, they believe in fairy tales. Okay, it is the best da'wah to atheism in years. It's amazing da'wah to atheism. But it, it's not a lecture by an atheist professor presenting an atheistic message. It's a, it's a really interesting, intelligent, well-produced TV show. And it's got the message embedded within. Well, we need to do the same thing. For the Muslims on the edge, we need to present the message of Islam, in a sense, without presenting the message of Islam. Right? So that's the, the, the first category. The second category, I said, people that are seeking, right? They're, they decided they want to learn more about Islam. They're not really fitting in the masjid environment. The halaqa is too intense for them. They're going to find answers where? Online. Let me tell you the challenge with online. And this is after meeting with several scholars, even government agencies around the world. There's a problem. The problem is online, uh, you can end up finding something very good or you can end up finding something extremely problematic. And extremism in religion sells. Ex Hindu extremism is very good sales. Christian extremism, good sales. Islam-based extremism, really good sales. So what happens online with extreme groups, extremist groups, for example, groups that wanted to have young people join ISIS, for example, around the world. They actually developed a media strategy they showed, oh, first we're going to make really nice videos about Akhir al-Zaman. There's the Jal, the coming of the Mahdi, the, the black flag, you know, all of this, yeah? And people really want to watch these videos. Oh, subhanAllah, Rasul Sallallahu said this. And a young 17-year-old is watching this. Then they'll connect it. They'll, they'll, the next set of videos is going to be the importance of hijrah in Islam. And this, kid, this kid's already watching this channel. He's like, oh yeah, hijrah, yeah, we have to make hijrah. And you have to have, you have to become people of Akhirah and you have to leave dunya. And then your family is a fitna for you. And so they'll have these videos. And the, the, the first one was really small and interesting. And the next one makes you a little bit more extreme. Next one, a little bit more extreme. Next one, a little bit more extreme. Until they've successfully brainwashed after five, six videos, it is fard on you to pack your bags, get your passport and make hijrah. And there's a, there's a trend. It's called a funnel. In marketing, they call this a funnel. So, there, so people that are looking for Islam online, they're looking for innocent reasons. But there are many attempts to, to direct them in different directions. You understand? And depending on the algorithm, if people have done their good work in marketing and bu building their algorithm, they can take them in any multitude of directions. I just gave you an example of violent extremism, but this could be somebody who wants them to head towards one group or one jama'ah or one cult or one whatever, they, they can push them in that direction, right? And so the population online, or the, this, this huge population that is seeking answers, we are not, if we don't give them real solutions on the ground, then the internet is far too dangerous. There's far, it's, it's too dangerous. And you know, and I'm not, I'm a beneficiary of the internet. Like a lot of people only know me because they Googled something about the Qur'an and they found my videos and all of that, right? But they can just as easily find somebody else and, you know, and, 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 and end up in some very crazy ideas, right? So what has to happen for this group is we have to understand what it is that they need, what it is that they're afraid of. They're afraid of being judged. They need a message that is simple so they can start at the basic steps and then go up and up and up and up and up. 
They're seeking, but they're not advanced yet. There's a, it's a woman, she wants to become more Islamic, she's not wearing hijab yet, but she wants to learn. She's taking her first steps. If she walks in and people just say, you have to wear hijab, it's far on day one, she's going to walk away and never come back. You just lost a customer. Right? You have to grow that, develop that customer until they are ready. Right? So, you know, Rasul Sallallahu was given the, the, the example uh, in Surah Al-Fatih at the end, right? أَخْرَجَ شَطْأَهُ فَآزَرَهُ فَاسْتَغْلَضَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوقِهِ The Rasul Sallallahu is describing, Allah is describing Rasul Sallallahu and the Sahaba like a plant that grows and matures. These are like very weak plants, very delicate plants that need to be grown and matured. So we have to create those kinds of social environments and learning environments where people that are seeking can actually meet knowledgeable people, they can meet others, they can meet a support group, and they can develop that easily. And they don't feel intimidated that everybody else is so much more Muslim than me, I feel out of place. They, they, they are in need of this. And we are in need of providing that kind of an environment for such groups. Even if we cannot do this inside of the masjid, or inside of the Islamic University, maybe we can do this at a cafeteria. Maybe we can do this in a university lounge. Maybe we can use this in open, safe spaces, public spaces. But those kinds of spaces need to be created and encouraged so that those people can also have a chance. I was really happy to see that I had, when I had done my uh, story night event here, and I had done a, a large story night event in Jakarta, uh, a lot of people came, a lot of men and women came. So many of them were non-Muslims. And, and many of them were not, not observing hijab and all of that. And I was happy to see them. Some people saw that and said, Astaghfirullah, women are not wearing hijab. And I was like, Alhamdulillah, those women that are even not wearing hijab are here. Because they're taking a step. We don't know where they are in their journey. So this is a, this is a, a, a solution that is needed. Because if we don't provide that solution, the internet will provide its own alternatives. So it's a very dangerous track to go down. Now the third one. This is, I think, the third one is where this office and institutions like these can really help. This third one. Muslims with harsh views. Muslims with harsh views believe they understand the sunnah. They believe this, that hadith says this. This is what it means. And they don't have a lot of deep knowledge. Because you can only have harsh views when you don't have deep knowledge. And they believe that anybody who disagrees with them doesn't have real knowledge. What needs to happen with those kinds of groups is instead of targeting the group, you have to target the issue. If it's lihya, if it's isbal, if it's musiqa, whatever issue it is, whatever the issue is, you have to, as, as scholars in the country, they have to get together and look at all the different views on it and get even you know representatives of the different views and have a discussion about the evidences and present the solution to the ideas and say this is what the scholars have said this is our attitude towards each other these are the differences that have existed for this long the people who hold this view are this the people who hold this view are this and we respect all of them if something is based on ijma it's ijma we can't change that but if there's an issue that's mukhtalaf fihi then we should not pretend that there's ijma when it's mukhtalaf fihi. It's, it's mukhtalaf fihi, you know? And if we can create those kinds of discussions and then target especially the harsh audience and say, by the way, this thing that you think is dalil is not dalil. Or you're saying this is absolutely sahih, actually it's not, it's daif, you know? Like for example, a, 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 a narration example of this is... Um, because marriage and divorce are sensitive topics, right? A lot of times people develop very strong views about it without looking at the situation. Sometimes divorce is, because there are muftis sitting here, you guys know, sometimes divorce is the best solution. It's a rahmah from Allah. Other times, it's too, you're, you're rushing to judgment. But if you just start with, inna abghada halali indallah talaq. If you start with that, first of all, the narration is not that strong. And the Qur'an is saying, وَإِن يَتَفَرَّقَ يُغْنِ اللَّهُ كُلَّ مِنْ سَعَتِهِ Yeah? So what are we doing? We take this narration, which is not even sahih, it's actually very a lot of kalam on this hadith, and we put it above even the ayat of the Qur'an, 
And then somebody who's coming with a real problem in their marriage, we're saying to them, Now this is a lack of hikmah. And this is where ulama have a big role to play, a huge role to play, because a lot of times these narrations are being misused to create more and more and more harsh views. And that is a misrepresentation of sharia, it's a misrepresentation of the sunnah, and the only people who can defend against that are the scholars of the sharia and the scholars of the sunnah. And that's where even, even people might, like myself are not even qualified. We're not even at that level. But the, the muftis and the fuqaha, they have to now expose these conversations. Sometimes, and I'll, I'll be frank with you, sometimes I get a chance to have dinner with a mufti or a group of muftis. And we have just sitting chatting on the ta- dinner table and we have the most amazing conversation, right, on some issue. And I say, man, the public doesn't know. You guys are so cool. Because when you come in front of the camera, you're just, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. And you're very formal. And nobody knows that you actually have some really incredible insights and discussions and debates. Those dinner conversations that you have with each other on issues, they need to be filmed. I'm telling you. When that stuff gets filmed and that stuff gets out, the public changes. Then harshness starts going, extremism starts going down. So those are just some thoughts about the trends that I've seen in, in many Muslim countries and in many Muslim communities. And I'm almost sure that those same trends, some level of that exists here too, because it's a worldwide problem. It's not specific to Malaysia, it's actually worldwide. And there is something that we can do to address that and to help the ummah come closer and closer to one another and actually become ummatan wahida like Allah Azza wa Jal says. So those are just some few thoughts that I wanted to share. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. If there are any questions or anything I, or, or comments, I'd love to hear them, inshallah. So we in Malaysia, luckily we have uh, several institution, Islam institution, which is uh, control and manage uh, Muslim matters and do enforcement to avoid the deviation of religions. So, uh, how about the Muslim community, community in non-Muslim countries like America and UK? Uh, yeah. I think I'm sure they are they, uh, yeah, they, uh, facing uh, some challenges, which is, uh, for example, uh, unity fatwas and uh, decision of uh, Islamic scholars uh, which is uh, facing uh, a diversity of uh, opinion and sects. Uh, yeah. So, which is, I, for my experience, I was living in England for four years. Uh, for eight celebration, me celebrate, uh, and me and my neighbors, we are celebrating eight in different days. Yeah. So, me, my, my family celebrating today, and my, fam- uh, my, my neighbors are celebrating tomorrow. So you can can you share for us about your experience how to deal with this problem? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So Zakalah Khairin Mufti for your question. Um, so the the Muslim experience in minority countries is completely different from the Muslim experience in majority countries, uh, and there is no central regulating authority. There is no scholar that everybody says once this fatwa is given, everybody will accept this fatwa. It's not even by size, like the biggest masjid says Eid is tomorrow, uh, the small masjid says, oh yeah, we think it's the day after tomorrow. Sometimes they'll say it's the day after tomorrow only because the big one said it's tomorrow. <laughs> so the, the, this is not something that I think uh, can be solved, the, the fatwa regulation in a Muslim minority community. I don't think it's possible to solve it because... In, in especially in Western countries, we have this concept of freedom of religion, right? So everybody has their own idea and their, their, their right to choose whatever freedom or religious expression they want to choose. Um, I do believe, though, that my advice in the Muslim community in America, for example, has been that if your community is celebrating Eid on a certain day, just go with the community. And if somebody, like... You know, we're all Muslim in the end. So if there's one regulation, one, one authority that says it's this day, it's okay. You can give up your fiqh for the, for the better of the larger community. Right? So I think that that's more and more of that is starting to happen now. Um, I don't know about the, the Europeans as much, but at least in America, there's more and more united, like the major masjids, for example, the city I live in in Dallas, the, 
the masajid get together, the ayma get together, they say, you know what, we're going to have a joint a decision on Eid or start of Ramadan or whatever. And they'll, they'll do that together. Uh, that doesn't mean the whole city follows, but at least the major Islamic centers follow. And we have to know also that these, these masajid and these aima, these are all private institutions. None of these are government or regulated or a large authority kind of body. And even if they form a body of imams or, or something like that, it's still a very an informal institution. It's not government recognized in any way. So it doesn't really have any authority. So it's, it has authority so long as Muslims respect, okay, this group is respectable, we're going to go with their opinion. So that's the reality of it. And um, But I also think that fiqh issues, like the start of Eid and the start of Ramadan and things like that, they. To, I realized living in America, I realized that is not the real definition of unity. Uh, like you can have one People, people celebrating Eid on Saturday, another one is celebrating on Sunday, right? But they can still be a very united community because they're doing good things together. So a difference in, difference in fatwa or fiqh doesn't actually, in my opinion, constitute division in the ummah. Division is something deeper inside the hearts. And there are people praying in the same slough and they hate each other. That's division, right? People are saying salam, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah in the masjid and they don't know each other. And they don't care about each other. That's division. That's real division. So I, I think that our definition of unity needs a deeper look, actually. So, Allah Ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Insights on how to deal with uh, Islamophobia based on your maybe experience from, from the United States. Is there Islamophobia here? It, maybe it's not. As, uh, as critical as in the United States or in the Europe, but there are certain groups of people who are maybe felt, you know, very uh, quite afraid of what is uh, what is being preached, what is being taught in the masjids. Maybe even the mention of Islam frightens a uh, certain quarter of society. I think that's our fault. What people don't know enough about is when you don't know a lot about something, then you can be scared of it easily, right? So the branding. The branding of Islam was supposed to be done by us. It was supposed to be done by me and you, right? I go to I go to a library in Minnesota and talk about the Quran to a bunch of Americans, non-Muslims, right? And I don't try to talk about how we're not crazy. We're not trying to blow you up. I don't have a bomb in my belt. I don't I don't say any of that. I just talk about the Quran and its relationship with the Bible and its history and its beauty, and all of it. And you know what? Two minutes into the conversation, they're like, he's not extreme. He's, this is what a Muslim's like. He can speak. Like, they're not, they're not, where's his camel? And you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> but the idea is that we should, we should present a positive narrative of Islam. And the truth is, there are people that are saying scary things in the name of Islam. That's the truth. And if you've heard one or two of those things, then you're going to be scared. If you go online and listen to some things that are being said in the name of Islam, I get scared. Like, I have that guy's Islamophobia because <laughs> what they're saying is crazy. That's crazy. And any reasonable human being would think that's crazy. So we, we do have to present the message of our religion. We shouldn't assume that because you're living in a Muslim country, everybody should know what Islam is. No, they don't. They don't. I was, I'm born Muslim. I've lived my childhood in Saudi And I, I, I moved to the United States. And I did not know anything about the Quran until I decided to learn it myself after high school, after going through a phase of atheism. And I'm a product of the Muslim world first. So there's hundreds of millions like me that can be raised in the Muslim world and are as confused about Islam as some white kid in Wisconsin in America. Just as confused. Because they, they don't have a connect a direct connection. So Islamophobia starts winning when we don't make public engagement uh, uh, accessible. I'll say one quick thing about this that I think, again, solutions are important, right? So I can identify the problem, we should identify the solution. Education is not the solution. People easily give that in speeches and talks. We must provide education. Listen, education is boring. 
Nobody wants education. No, no, no teenager says, okay, fine, time for education. I didn't say it, you didn't say it when we were teenagers. You know what's interesting? TikTok's interesting. Instagram's interesting. You know why? Because it's short and it's entertaining and it's enriching. What do we have to do to present, to undo the phobia? We have to present Islam in the way that the world is consuming enriching material. When they consume enough of that, then they will want to watch something that's 10 minutes long. When they consume that, then they'll come towards education. The first step, st step is enrichment, then there's awareness, then there's education. The problem is we keep providing education, nobody comes. And then we say, how come nobody comes? We're providing so much education. Yeah, because you're not interesting. Because nobody cares about you. And we're going to make, we're going to spend billions of dollars and make an Islamic channel. It's the most boring channel. Like even the Islamic guy changes the channel. <laughs> it's gonna guess. Nobody wants to see that. You see? Which, which is why I was saying about the show, right? The, the house show. It's entertaining, but it's got a message. If you want to reach the people, you've got to reach them at their frequency. Then, enough, some of them, small percent of them, will come towards education. The first step is not education. The last step is education. We have to concern ourselves with the first two steps before that. Well, you know, I was, I was doing my story night event. I did not use any mustalahat at tafsir. I didn't say Qal ibn Kathir, Qal ibn Abbas, you know, Naqashahu uh, ibn Ashur. I didn't say any of this stuff. I was just, it's like a comedy night. I'm just telling the story. I'm, I'm cracking jokes. And somebody came to me and said, What's that? You don't use any ilm. Where's the ilm? And I was like, not here. That's in the tafsir program. That's when I do education. That's the time for that. This is not the time for education. This is the time for enrichment. Because these people need that step. Then they'll come to the next step. Then they'll come to the next step. خَاطِبُ النَّاسِ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ عُقُولِهِمْ We have to, we have to, we understand that. Now it's time to تطبيق, right? We have to apply that now. The application will be, we have to create really interesting media. Really interesting engagement that anybody, the non-Muslim would want to watch it. And what's, what's the, how do you know we're doing it right? If your 12-year-old is interested, you succeeded. If you had to force them, you failed. It's easy formula. So we have to study the 12-year-old now and understand what, what is it that interests the 13-year-old, the 14-year-old. What is it that interests them? And until we produce what interests them, we're failing. Inshallah. No, not we're failing, inshallah. But, <laughs> but we will succeed, inshallah. Zakumullah khair. I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Qur'an all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Qur'an. We are students of the Qur'an ourselves and we want you to be students of the Qur'an alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Qur'an a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube, but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Qur'an beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family, and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.